So, uh, Ngami Hinui Kia Koto, Ko Cheryl Doig Toko Ingwa, no Tatahi Aho. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of Ako O Tatahi. Uh, and to start with, I'm just going to share my screen um, with you and uh, just share a little bit about uh, today's session. So welcome everyone, this session's uh, Ōtatahi Economic Skills and Employment Update. Really excited to have you here and to be hosting uh, Karen for this conversation. So if you don't know about Ako Ōtatahi Learning City uh, Christchurch, uh, I'm one of the, the, the trustees of, of um, Ako Ōtatahi and uh, we're the hosts of today's conversations. The, uh, the trust supports the city to become a, a coordinated, equitable and future ready city where learning is available to uh, anyone. And so everyone has, uh, has access and we can't do this alone. It requires a movement for, for change and that's where you come in and why these connections are really important. So there are, we have three PO or things that we focus on in Akawa Tahi. The first is um, focused on uh, equity, the, the second on access, and the, the third one on um, innovation. We're committed to creating opportunities for everyone. Mm. And um, mm. we, we, we yeah, support. what they actually do. Sorry, just can you turn your microphones on to mute? Thank you. Um, we support this by in, engaging with leaders and champions of change, amplifying opportunities and innovations, advocating for equity and connecting people ideas and local change movements. So thank you for joining us today and helping us grow our ecosystem. Uh, <clears throat> today's uh, session is um, with, with Karen and um, uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, do a little bit of a, an intro. Great. So um, we're Privileged to have you, Karen, uh, to share some thoughts with us today. Karen is the talent specialist at Christchurch NZ. I think that's a really cool name. I quite like to be a talent specialist. Um, Karen has a broad experience across international marketing, project management, and international education in, in England, Indonesia, Singapore, and now in Christchurch. Karen's role as the talent team and, and the talent team focuses on ensuring we're attracting and retaining the right people to help build the region's economy and that education provision and industry uh, is aligned. So today, Karen will share the latest updates from Christchurch, New Zealand um, regarding how the economy has fared over the past year and how this has impacted on skills and employment in Ōtatahi. They'll also, she'll also provide an update of future industry growth opportunities within our super nodes and some of the initiatives that the city uh, is undertaking in relation to equity, uh, inclusion and innovation. So um, welcome, Karen. It's great to have you here and I'm going to hand over to you. Awesome. Kia ora koto and thank you so much, Cheryl, for that introduction. Um, I think you've set it up well. I'm just going to share my screen. Everyone can see that? Is that good, Cheryl? Perfect. Um, so thank you so much for those who are joining live and also to those who are watching this later as a recorded session. Um, I hope that it's useful. I, as Cheryl said, um, we're sort of really going to do a little bit of an update uh, just for a little bit of extra background as well. So I work with Christchurch NZ. Christchurch NZ is the economic development agency for Christchurch uh, and also the promotions agency. And I work within the regional growth team, which um, is focused on really sort of building clusters around certain industries, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And my role is really in the skills and employment space. And as Cheryl said, uh, trying to sort of work towards education industry uh, aligning and, and making sure that particularly our, our sort of domestic and local rangatahi um, understand what the pathways are to meaningful work. So 
today we're going to run through, I'll do a little bit of a socioeconomic update to begin with, uh, and then just a bit of a labour market update. Obviously, the last year has um, seen lots of changes in both of those areas, so we'll run through that. Talk a little bit about future skills and employment, and particularly our growth industries, and then a, a sort of review or overview of some of the current initiatives and then happy to take questions. I know Cheryl's got um, some questions as well, so we can have a bit of a discussion at the end. So just moving through first, uh, just sort of looking at some of the economic activity indexes. And I will say as well, all of this information is available on our website. So on Christchurch NZ's website, there is a, an economic dashboard and there's also a wellbeing um, dashboard as well. So, uh, and that is updated monthly. So if you want to keep up to date, that's the place to do it. Um, the ac activity index, what this does is really measure a whole lot of activity um, in terms of manufacturing, spend, visitor spend, um, job seeker numbers. So it sort of takes a whole lot of different indicators and creates a, a sort of index out of that. So you can see there that we are sort of heading back up towards um, sort of beyond where we were back in January 2020 and following pretty similar patterns there to, to what National is showing as well. Um, GDP is part of that index, but it's probably the most common indicator that people look at when they're looking at to see how the economy is faring. Um, and you can see again, relatively similar to what we're seeing nationally um, and again back up to sort of beyond where we were in terms of activity a couple of years ago so pretty positive um, indications from GDP as well. Um, retail spending as well I'll just move that so I can see um, so again we are actually up above where we were a year ago um, and that is total retail spending. So that also takes into account the fact that we obviously don't have as many international visitors. Um, so retail spending is looking pretty good um, regionally as well. What we have started doing as well is looking at uh, our economy more broadly than just those traditional indicators like GDP and sort of manufacturing and spend and looking at different well-being measures as well. So there is a dashboard that's available on our website and it measures a whole lot of um, sort of indicators across things like safety, um, community engagement, and, and a few others that we'll look at here as well. This is relatively new. We started doing this last year. It was um, led out by the council. Um, so some of the, the things we'll look at, we can't actually compare because they're relatively new, but it's quite useful to know that this information is available and will be measured going forward as well. So one of the indicators we look at is people's sort of own, um, I guess, perceptions of their ability to afford, every day, afford everyday needs. And we can see there, I think it's over 90% of, of people surveyed do say that they've got sort of enough uh, money for everyday needs. This is a relatively new measure. So this is something that we'll need to sort of measure going forward and see how things track. The other is quality of life. So this was, um, we've actually, it's two different surveys. So here we're comparing in the red 2019 and in the green 2020. Um, so it, it was sort of two different surveys, but we can still measure that. As you can see, it, it's a bit uneven, um, which is sort of what you'd expect, I guess, in a year like we've had, that not everybody's experiences have been the same. Um, so we can see in 2020, there were actually more people that said their life was extremely good, um, fewer that said sort of good, neither, and then um, a few more that said their quality of life was poor. So um, yeah, I guess sort of not really a surprise that obviously the last year has, has impacted different people in different ways. Uh, in terms of hope for the future, um, again, this was a, a sort of new measure, so something that will be interesting to track. Um, most people, so over half the people surveyed said they expect their quality of life to be about the same over the next 12 months. Um, but then sort of, I guess, more people feeling positively that it would be much better or slightly better than those who thought that it would be 
worse in some way, which was around 10%. So it will be interesting to just track this over the coming months and years. And like I said, that is available on the website. Just to have a look at labour market and how that's tracked over the past year. Um, so Canterbury, if we compare a year on year increase, so from March 20 to March 21, Canterbury saw a 49% increase in total job seekers. Uh, and that's an unemployment rate of about 5.2%. I think um, what's sort of interesting to think about as well is that our population has increased over the past 12 months as well. So Canterbury has around 10,000 more um, people in job seeker age range. So sort of from 18 to 65. Uh, so we do have about 10,000 more job seekers in Canterbury um, and so that sort of ha has increased as well. There, there are around 4,000 more job ready or work ready job seekers now than there were pre-COVID. Uh, but like I said, there, there has also been a population increase. So we sort of need to look at the two of those together. Um, if we look at gender, so again, this is sort of as a caveat, this is MSD figures. So obviously this only shows us those who are applying for or receiving a benefit through MSD. Uh, and we know that a number of people for a number of different reasons are, are not receiving benefits, so they won't show up in the numbers. If we look in terms of gender, it looks sort of relatively similar uh, between males and females. Um, but as I said, that's not necessarily a true reflection because we know some women, for example, um, are not eligible for benefits. Um, so the numbers could be different to what, what, what's reflected here. <clears throat> uh, if we look at ethnicity, again, we can see there that um, in terms of increase or year on year change over the past year, Pacifica and other ethnicities have been impacted more than um, sort of European and Māori. Uh, but we know, of course, as well, that Māori are incredibly overrepresented in job seeker numbers. They make up about 24% of job seekers and only about 9% of the population. So although that increase looks um, sort of less than it has been on others, uh, we know that obviously that is, um, you know, they, they are at risk of unemployment and are overrepresented anyway. Um, if we look at age group as well, we can see that it has been mainly younger workers and older workers who have been impacted the most, um, particularly those sort of 18 to 24 years old, we have seen an increase there of 43%. Um, if we look as well at the NEAT rate, so this is people aged 15 to 24 who are not in unemployed, uh, not in education, employment or training. In Christchurch in March, we were at 9.1%, uh, nationally 12.9%. Uh, we do normally sit at around 7%. It does tend to go up sort of middle of the year when we have graduates coming out um, or students sort of finishing their study and not yet in the workforce. Uh, but that is a number that we're keeping our eye on as well. This is a, a really good news slide. This is jobs online. So this measures it sort of based on an index um, from back that was first measured back in 2007. Uh, if we look at Canterbury there, the red line, we can see um, sort of quite a significant spike big early this year. And we actually have more jobs available online than we have in the past sort of 10 years. Um, so really good news there for Canterbury. Uh, Christchurch is slightly lower, um, but Canterbury is looking pretty good in terms of jobs online. So what does this all mean? And um, a bit of an overview of future skills and employment. I thought it would be useful just to have a look at our, our sort of current state. So what, where is our employment? And if we take a look at this, we can see that 
about 64% of workers actually work in five industries. Um, so we have nearly 50,000 workers working in retail trade and accommodation. And then if we look at manufacturing, construction, professional um, scientific services and health, the majority of our workers work across those five industries. If we look at where the growth has been, um, again, we can see healthcare. So this is the number of new jobs that have been created over the past four years. And we can see healthcare in particular, sort of nearly seven and a half thousand new jobs over the past four years. Um, public administration, safety, manufacturing, also um, sort of quite a large number of jobs and also expected to grow as well. Um, Cheryl mentioned the super notes in the introduction and this is work that Christchurch NZ started doing a couple of years ago and we really looked at global trends, we looked at our sort of regional in terms of Canterbury, our regional capability um, and local advantage. So where do we have some real strength regionally and where is their global opportunity and sort of found the sweet spot where all of those connect and um, identified that there were four industries where we had real opportunity to grow as a region. And those four industries were aerospace and future transport, food, fiber and agri-tech, high-tech services and health tech and resilient communities. And we can sort of see if we think back to where most of our employment is, we've got a, you know, a really large health sector already um, and manufacturing which sits within that aerospace and future transport um, sector as well as really strong for Canterbury. So Christchurch NZ has been working with industry and with education to really identify where the opportunities are within these sectors. So they're, they're all pretty big industries. Um, and so we can't be good at absolutely everything in food, fiber and agri-tech. So over the past sort of six months, really, we've gone through a process of identifying where the real niche opportunities are within each of these sectors. So within Christchurch NZ, we have specialists working in food and fiber and health tech and in aerospace. And they are working really closely with industry and education to, like I said, sort of really identify where are those niche opportunities that we can develop clusters around. Um, food fiber sector has identified biotech as the sort of real niche opportunity right now. And we are working to sort of support the development of a cluster there. So health tech again are sort of working through that process and aerospace as well so that we can actually sort of develop clusters um, around some of those niche opportunities. This slide has a lot of information, so I won't go through it. We will be sharing the slides afterwards, but this is really for educators. Um, so this is looking at each of those sectors and what we're hearing from industry in terms of the skills that they need within each of those. Um, and so that, that's sort of what industry is saying, we need people with these skills now and also into the future as well. So this is quite useful if you are an educator or a parent and thinking about, um, you know, talking to youth and your children around where some opportunities might be. This is where industry is saying that they're really going to need skills as these industries grow. On our website as well, um, this information is available there and you can also link through to education pathways so where you can actually study these, these things in the region. Um, this I think actually Joanna when she presented as part of the learning days last week presented these slides but I thought it's worth presenting again. Um, and this is just a little bit about what the most in demand skills are in New Zealand and then the next slide shows regionally as well and I think what's really important about this is just as you can see it's, it's transferable skills. Um, this was some research that TEC did nationally. They looked at uh, over a million job ads in New Zealand and sort of pulled out the, the most common skills that employers or recruiters were looking for and communication skills, problem solving, detail oriented and organisational skills were the top four. 
We did some surveying last year as well of Canterbury businesses. So we surveyed around 50 businesses um, who were our largest employers. And again, you can see the top four skills that they're looking for are those transferable or soft skills, teamwork, problem solving, self-management and interpersonal skills. And all of these sort of came before the next one, which is those specialist skills or, or skills that are actually needed to perform the role. Um, so I think we, we keep hearing how important transferable skills are, but certainly it's what industry is telling us that they really need um, now and into the future as well. Um, just uh, another update as well. So we did do a, a workforce report at the end of last year and what we found in that report was really significant growth in terms of demand for semi-skilled workers. So that's people that have sort of certificate level four type qualifications and a relatively stable demand for highly skilled workers. So this was research that was done looking at job advertisements. And I think what's really interesting is that that, that is a bit of a problem for, for both the region and nationally as well when we look at what young people are studying. And we can see there the blue line is sort of bachelor or degree level study and above. The red line there is um, certificates and diplomas. And you can see that over the past 10 years, there's been a real decrease in the number of um, students sort of going into that vocational education and certificate and diploma level and a fairly steady sort of increase in terms of students doing degree level study. Um, and like I said, what we're actually seeing in terms of the demand is that there's really that they're looking for more graduates that have those vocational level um, qualifications. So a challenge for the region. Um, also, if we look at it this way, so it's similar information. This is for Canterbury. It's looking at enrollments. And as you can see, Polytech enrollments over the past five years, sort of steady decrease in terms of the number of students enrolling in vocational study. And if we look at universities, a, a sort of steady increase. Uh, apprenticeships and training shows the same, um, same decline there. So certainly a challenge. Like I said, it's, it's a national challenge, um, but something that we are looking at regionally as well. So I thought just based on some of that information that we'd just go over some of the initiatives that Christchurch NZ is involved in. Um, there is a lot happening in this in the sort of skills and employment and pathway space and a lot of organisations locally doing some really um, awesome initiatives. So we are partnering with others on some of these and I thought we'd just sort of run through four just to give a little bit of an idea of some of the activity that's happening. So one of the projects we've been involved in is Hopara, and this is a collaboration with University of Canterbury and ARA. Um, we've also been working with um, Naito Huriri Education on a place-based learning component to this program as well. And this program is really a, a program designed to inspire and support first and family learners into tertiary education. So we are at the moment partnering with Linwood um, College, uh, looking also to work with Hayata this year as well. Um, and this is a program, it's largely, it's based on a, a model from Georgia State University um, in the States, which was very successful. And, and it largely sort of focuses on mentoring. So we have students from UC and ARA going into the school and working with students who have the capability to go on to tertiary study, um, but perhaps don't sort of have, um, it, it might not sort of be the, the expected next step for them. And so it's really to try to break down some of those barriers um, and to really, um, I guess, open up the possibility of them going into tertiary study. So we started this last year as a pilot and um, got some really good feedback. So it's something that we're working on developing and expanding into other schools over the coming year or two as well. Uh, as I said, there, there is also a place-based learning component to this, so working with um, industry as well to actually get students into 
um, industry and, and doing some sort of real world experience um, activities as well. It, it's, it's slightly sort of focused on STEM. So we are looking at really encouraging students into STEM at uh, tertiary level, but not only STEM. Uh, the second is Education to Employment Project. So this is a program that is uh, was developed by Ministry of Social Development and Ministry of Education. We are supporting this program by um, funding an extra full-time person to work on this project. And again, this is really working with schools and working with individual students to support them into further education or employment. Um, we're working with a service provider in Christchurch who does real one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so if it's taking a student to go and get their driver's license or making sure they're dressed properly and taking them along to, to meet an employer for an interview, um, whatever that individual needs in terms of sort of holistic support to, to take that next step out of school is what the program is really designed to do. Uh, so that started last year, it's a two year initiative. So we're really keen to support that. Um, like I said, we're supporting it this year and really keen to see that program continue as well. Um, the next one is Start Me Up. So this was a very cool initiative that we partnered with Ministry of Social Development on. And this was a program to support job seekers into self-employment. So it was really job seekers who um, maybe they had an idea for a business or maybe they were interested in going into self-employment. And we worked with Ministry of Awesome and ThinkLink from UC to deliver firstly an online program. So it was a webinar series where they learned about how to start a business. Um, we had about 120 people actively engaged in that program. Um, so sort of going through that six week program. And we then had, they could then apply for the next stage, which was an accelerator program. We had, I think 48 applications for the program and 25 uh, are going through that program now. Um, so we're about halfway through. And the idea is that that program, it's an in-person um, weekly program, accelerator program, where they really sort of delve into their idea and develop a business plan. So the idea is at the end of it, they will have um, a pretty well constructed business plan and um, there's ongoing support as well for that through business mentors, the Chamber of Commerce um, and flexi wage funding through Ministry of Social Development as well. So there's some very cool ideas in that program and we're really looking forward to sharing some of them at the end of it. Um, but we're really, really impressed with some of the ideas that have come out of it and hopefully we'll get some awesome businesses um, in Christchurch out of it. Uh, the third one is just innovation ecosystem. So this is um, Christchurch doesn't perform particularly well in terms of uh, innovation at the moment. So if we look at sort of number of patents that come out of Christchurch, it is lower in terms of our, our population than Wellington, uh, Auckland and Waikato. Um, and also in terms of the amount of venture capital that our um, startups attract here in the region, it's also lower than some of those other regions. So we're really keen to support the innovation ecosystem. Um, it's important for growth of our economy that we do have new businesses starting. A lot of employment comes from new businesses. Um, so we are supporting the development of that ecosystem through funding um, through Te Ahaka based at ARA and also um, Think Lab and UCE at UC. So looking to see more um, businesses coming out of Christchurch. Uh, also, in terms of the work that we're doing across skills and employment or the labour market, there's also been quite a lot of mapping um, and sort of gap analysis. So over the past year, looking at, like I said, there's a lot happening. So it was a case of, of sort of really trying to, um, I guess, get a good handle on, on what is happening and where there were some gaps. And if we look at these four projects here, this has been, I guess, identified gaps where we thought that we could actually partner with others to deliver some impact. The other program that I wanted to talk about, and basically I will take any opportunity to uh, talk about this because I think it's such an awesome program. Um, this is a new program 
from developed by TEC. It's called Inspiring the Future. It is being launched later this month. So I thought it's a great opportunity to talk to you. It's really relevant whether you're an educator or whether you are a working person. Um, it's a very cool program that is, again, it's based on sort of internationally what's happening as well. Um, I am going to just show a little video, so I'll just check that it works. Um, if it doesn't, we'll talk it through, but we'll just check whether this video plays. I wanted to be a rugby player. I was thinking maybe a YouTuber. Maybe a gamer. Like, maybe be some sport and you get a lot of money. Maybe be on TikTok. You start talking to these, the rangatai, these young people, and you realise, oh, I actually do have a bit of a cool job. I've never volunteered for anything like this before. I'm not really much of a storyteller. They've never talked to anyone who's done this job before. Imagine building skate parks. Now I want to be a software engineer so I can make apps. Being an electrician is pretty cool. It's really helped me figure out what I want to do. It would be so hard to get into this field if you didn't ever have someone to look at and say, oh, I can, I can be like them. I really felt that I made a difference. It was the best feeling. It was awesome. I'm just going to share again. Oops, why is it not working? Oops, sorry. Oops, I might just stop sharing and go back. Yes. Too. We might need to go on to the next slide. Before yeah, we I will. I'll just... And... Awesome. Um, so, yeah, it's a very cool program and it's basically to inspire young people into... Um, jobs that they probably don't see or aren't aware of. And it was based on research, international research that showed that career aspirations form at a young age, uh, that most children sort of aspire to a relatively small number of different careers. And obviously, as we sort of know that there's some real difference in aspirations between girls and boys, and also, um, you know, based on ethnicity and socioeconomic factors as well. Um, but ultimately what they found was that children's aspirations reflect their exposure to different types of careers. And so the idea of this program is that it actually exposes young kids to different opportunities and different options. Um, they did a, um, it was called During, Drawing the Future. Uh, they had 7,000 school kids from around New Zealand draw what they thought their future career would be or the future job would be. And around 50% for both boys and girls, around 50% was seven jobs. So sports person was the, the um, top. If we look at girls, um, vet, teacher, artist, police officer, doctor, singer, boys, there was some crossover actually, which I know other countries like Australia, there was apparently no crossover or overlap at all between boys and girls. Um, so sort of similar, but again, you know, police officer, builder, firefighter, army, so some differences in gender there as well. But like I said, what they found is that over 50% really sort of sat in seven jobs and they tended to be the jobs that people see the most. 
Um, in terms of those differences between boys and girls, boys were nine times more likely to want to be a trade worker, um, five times more likely to be a firefighter, four times more likely to be an engineer. Um, girls, 14 times more likely to aspire to become some sort of beauty industry worker, um, 10 times more likely to be a teacher and eight times more likely to, to aspire to work in the health sector. So. Uh, the other thing that was quite interesting as well is just if we look at um, what kids sort of want to be and then what our labour market's actually going to need, so jobs that our economy is going to need in 2028, as you can see, quite a mismatch. Um, again, this probably isn't anything new, um, but I think with so much change, um, technological change in terms of jobs and the disruption that's having, the more that we can expose young kids to different opportunities at a young age and sort of aspire them into some of these roles is a great opportunity. So um, what they found as well was that childhood career aspirations actually do tend to shape the careers that they pursue in adulthood. So there is a real opportunity to, if we can sort of inspire uh, kids at a younger age that can actually have an impact on, on what they choose to do when they're older. Um, and also the opportunity to, to use learning and the school environment to actually inspire kids. So there is this amazing website called Inspiring the Future. It has actually been up and running the program since last year, but it was being piloted in different regions. Canterbury wasn't one of them. Um, it is sort of being launched nationally later this month. I would recommend that you check out the website. It's a really awesome program where it's quite structured. So if you are somebody who has um, a job that uh, you know you think is interesting. Uh, th it's really structured. You don't have to sort of develop a presentation or anything like that. You can sort of turn up um, and, and the program is quite well structured. If you're an educator, there's a whole lot of support wrapped around this. So there's sort of pre-learning activities before you actually have people come in. Um, and, and again, it's very structured in terms of what, you know, how this program is actually delivered in schools. Um, it's essentially you have, have a number of workers coming in together um, and the kids sort of engage in a bit of a 20 questions type thing to try to choose what they do. And then they have the opportunity to have sort of small group interactions and find out more about the jobs as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good opportunity. We know that a challenge for us is, um, you know, to really inspire young people into some of those sectors and industries of the future. And we feel that this is a really good way to do it. So please do check out the website. There's all sorts of resources on there as well. And that's the website. Um, and I think that was about it. So I'll just stop sharing. Um, that was about me, Cheryl. Thanks, that was great. Um, I'd, uh, as you were you're talking, I was exploring the websites and uh, writing a few um, questions and, and so on. But um, we've got a, a, a question to start off with um, from Carl. Do you want to just talk to the question that you put in the chat box, Carl? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Hey, great, great presentation, Karen. Really enjoyed it. Um, just reflecting on those centres of vocational excellence that got set up under Rove, been, I've seen them making a bit of noise nationally, particularly in food and fibre, but haven't heard anything about them locally. Is there, um, is there a connection between Aka Otatahi and those coves, or are you thinking about building a relationship with those coves? I'm thinking particularly of their the fact that they've been tasked to drive innovation into vocational education training? Yeah, it's a really good question, Carl, and I'm probably not the best person to answer it. Um, so certainly Simon, our regional growth manager, and Robin Cox, who's our food and fibre specialist, are certainly involved in that and working on that. So I'd be able to give a much better update than I can. Um, but really happy to, Cheryl, if it will work, maybe even just put a little bit of a slide in about that just to add into the presentation that we can share um, afterwards. They would certainly be able to give a sort of more up-to-date um, overview of what's happening there. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I had a, a question about the uh, the wellbeing measures. You said we're on the website and um, they're quite buried wherever they are. And so if you could give us some guidance as to where they are and, and whether they're, whether it's in a, 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 um, a report form or whether it's an, a living, breathing piece of work. Yeah, good question, Cheryl. I'll just pop the link into the presentation as well so that everyone gets that. But it is actually available in a dashboard, so it's very user-friendly. It sort of has across the top the different um, areas, like I said, sort of safety, um, you know, income, um, community engagement. There's about 10 different areas of uh, that are measured, and you can literally click on them, and it is updated. Um, I'm going to say monthly, Cal, you might even know because I think it's probably one of your surveys that you do, but it, 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 the surveying is done throughout the year um, and it is certainly updated um, sort of regularly throughout the year, but it's quite user-friendly. It's pretty easy once you know where it is, Cheryl, um, to actually engage and check those out. That'd be great because I, you know, it's a, I'd love to see it somewhere because it's so tied to the economic development um, to have it somewhere really easily accessible. Yeah, yeah. What other questions do people have? Just give a, a wave or a, a comment. Otherwise I'll carry on with mine. <laughs> Go Grant. Yeah, uh, thanks Karen. That was really informative and um, you know, it's really nice to, to get an update on where things are. Um, look, I had a question around, um, you talked about the in-demand skills and the skills businesses are identified for future learning, um, but I'm not seeing them coming through the workflow. You know, uh, where, is, do you, where do you see the development of those skills sitting? And by the way, I'm from the Ministry of Education, so I should probably be answering the question myself, but, but is there something in the Christchurch NZ space that uh, you see as an initiative that can help with that? Uh, again, I think it's a really good question. And I think, I mean, we are we are trying to work, I think historically we've worked quite closely with tertiary institutions as an economic development agency. We've really looked at that end of the pipeline. And as we know, that's too late. Um, you know, when you're talking about skills and when you're talking about actual, um, you know, qualification demand, um, once students are actually already studying at tertiary, it's too late. So I think over the past probably year or so, we have as an economic development agency started working a sort of, you know, back in, in that school space. Um, I mean, I don't think there's sort of an initiative yet that's really addressing that transferable skills piece, but I think it's certainly something in terms of the broader work that we're doing. Um, that I hope can be addressed through the work that we're doing more closely with schools. Yeah, I think it, what you said is it, it is it, it probably sits in our space more than it does in yours, but but yeah. and that's really good. But you know we know this, and we're but just uh, the questions are around how to link in what we're doing to the work that you're doing too. Hmm. Well, and I think that's the thing because obviously if you can show that alignment, um, which is probably where we can, you know, Ministry of Education and. Um, the Economic Development Agency should be working together because I think if, if you can show that alignment between what industry is actually looking for, which is more our space, um, then that sort of really helps educators, I think, take it on board. Cal? Can I ask the, um, <clears throat> the elephant in the room policy question, right? Which is, I think you've identified that we've got too many, too many students in university, particularly the bachelor's level, and not enough in vocational education training. Um, given we're supposed to have a regional partnership towards tertiary education, how, what are the levers we've got? <laughs> like, how do we, how do we, I don't even know how we start. I mean, I think Rove, the reform of vocational education, essentially came out of this challenge. So like I said, it's, it's not a regional, it's a regional challenge as well as a national one. Um, and I think as you can see from the, those, the data that I showed, it's been on a downhill slide for 10 years. And really that, that's where Rove came from was just the fact that the vocational education system was losing you know, tens of thousands of students a year. Um, so I think, you know, big picture, Rove is really the, I guess, the mechanism that's designed to deliver on that and to turn things around. Um, and obviously within that, there's a whole lot of initiatives. Um, yeah. There's the regional leadership groups. 
Um, I mean, there's a, a sort of, I think it's about a four year campaign at the moment to actually try to encourage people into vocational education in terms of sort of, you know, social and digital campaign. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I get all that, but I guess, I mean, I guess at some level, the reason it's a difficult question is at some level, it has to be zero sum, right? Like, you know, if we're going to drive more learners into VET, which absolutely we need to do, we, we're going to have to take them off the universities. And, you know, the universities aren't in Rove. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so those levers, those Rove levers don't reach into the university. It's just a, it's just an interesting regional problem. Oh, it is, it, and it, it's a massive challenge. And I mean, I think it's also a lot of it is just social, um, social perception that we know that most. I mean, research was done. I think it was actually Ministry of Education research showed that you know sixty percent of of kids think they're going to university, and about six percent think they're going to a polytech. Um, where does that come from? Partly their schools. We know that you know a lot of schools obviously want to see their kids going into university, but a lot of it comes from parents as well. Um, and it is that social um, perception that smart kids go to university. And, and so I think it, it is a big challenge, but it, it's it, it's across so many different areas. I was going to uh, ask the same. Um question as Carl so uh, I'll, I'll deepen that question a little bit more because um, this is it's a complex problem that you have to come from multiple angles and and uh, Akawa Tatahi Learning City Christchurch is a, a grassroots movement for change um, so if we were looking at it from a citywide perspective how, how can we um, help to influence especially parents and those people who um, uh, still thinking that you need to be a, a, a go to university, you need to be a lawyer or whatever it happens to be when the, the, the transferable skills that you mentioned um, come in a whole lot of different uh, industries and, and workplaces uh, but it's really really hard for some teachers to understand that and so um, the messages don't get to, to um, students some of them get blocked but also from parents so I'll be really interested in any thoughts you've got obviously this are the campaigns and, and I watch those and so on but a, a lot of, of parents will still have their own conversations about um, the things we've done in the same old ways and, and mm. we, we need to do things differently. Mm. Yeah, I mean I, I think it is a lot does come down to that perception change in education um, I mean, I know we take any opportunity we can get to get in front of careers advisors um, talking about where that future demand is, what employers are really looking at, you know, um, salary outcomes for students with different qualifications. Uh, I mean, I know if you look at those level four quals, um, you know, 10 years down the track, those, those graduates are doing pretty well. Um, and often things like that um, actually can make a difference to parents and, and their perceptions uh, and also to teenagers as well, who we know that that is one thing they think about. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think, Probably you can have all, all the different um, sort of initiatives in the world, but if you can't change those perceptions, as you said, it, it's within schools, it's, it's teachers, it's careers advisors, it's parents and it's whānau, all sort of thinking that the ultimate outcome is to go to university. And I think changing those perceptions through things like that, showing those outcomes, telling those stories, um, talking about, um, you know, those positive kind of outcomes of, of students that have different types of qualifications is probably a good start. Mm. I didn't read it that way um, myself. When I looked at the graph that you had, which showed an increase in the, the uh, university or degree qualified um, study, and uh, since 2011, it had actually been reasonably stable. Um, you could draw the line from 2010 because that was lower, but it looked reasonably stable. The, the decline was in the um, vocational training um, and and so if you take back to 2011 actually we did coincide with that level of tertiary training and a much higher level of vocational training so I don't think it's actually robbing necessarily our degree qualified it's it's bringing those who are not doing tertiary education into the fold um, and I see that you know the Rove what I'm very excited about of course from ministry point of view the 
the the Rove um, initiative, the exciting part is where it meets the school. And and if we can bring that further down where students at school can see opportunity and pathways much more clearly, then I see there's a greater opportunity for engagement in that space. So I, I hear you, Carl, in terms of zero sum, I just think the the part that we're losing are the ones that don't go to either. And, and you know, I think well, there's a great opportunity to engage in, in those people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where grant that exposure comes into it as well. Um, through programs like Inspire in the Future, we're, you know, working on different um, initiatives, like I said, Hopara is one of them, where you're actually getting mm. students into workplaces to experience, um, you know, different types of roles in different types of sectors is really important as well. Yeah, the, the examples you shared were really, really good in terms of, of just coming at the, the problem from different angles. And I agree, it's inspiring the future is it's just one small uh, program. And, and I love the fact that it is so uh, organized um, so that a business person can take part and it's reasonably easy to do. Uh, because if you don't know what exists, then you can't aspire to, um, to take that pathway. And, and Grant, just picking up on your, I mean, I'm with you, I think where Rove connects to secondary schools is the, is one of the sweet spots. Some of the work we do around student decision making highlights that where students don't know what they want to do, their teachers <clears throat> often default to suggesting university because the thing, you know, the other part of this equation is all teachers train at a university. So their experience, their default experience is a university pathway and not a VET one. I think, I think it's, well, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I, mean, I know talking to some careers advisors that they do get a lot of pushback from parents as well. So even if they can identify that a vocational pathway is best for students, that that's all great until the parents come along and, and then they sort of get that pressure on, I know they're not going to do that. Um, so I think it's sort of, yeah, definitely a challenge. Are we, are we still recording this? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, so <clears throat> we work with an unnamed polytechnic um, a few years ago, where we presented very similar research, the research you've talked about, to their senior management team about how there's awful and also all sorts of pressure from the parents for the kids to go to university. And everybody sitting around that table said, oh, that's horrible. That's, that's, that's awful. You know, why don't they cover, why aren't they encouraging their kids into a vocational education training pathway? So we said, right, hands up, who in this room has encouraged their kids to come to a polytech and who's encouraged them to go to university? And everybody in that room was encouraging their kids to go to university. And this is the senior management team at a large polytech. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it's it's about changing mindsets in, in a whole range range of different ways, and uh, also um, who in the schools with some of your program who decides which students get to um, be on it because there are examples of students who have been told by um, by teachers no that's not your pathway maybe you should get this sort of job, and um, uh, that determines. Mm. you know what what happens for them in the future so um and i yeah. think that's i mean obviously we have a completely different education system to that in europe but it, if you look at that as an example where those perceptions are just completely different um and yes the system is different um but you know university is seen as being quite academic and sort of you know a certain type of person would go there but it, it's not for everybody um so i think that yeah perceptions are, is huge mm. Mm. So um, I think we're, we're coming to the, the end of our um, time. It's been um, really great. And, and uh, having done this for two years in a row during our learning days, I think this needs to be a regular thing because um, what, we, what we do is, is with this recording, we'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel. We'll be sending it out to you folks. And um, Karen has, has kindly agreed to share our slides. Uh, and... Um, what we found last year is that it got used time and time again by different people uh, and we cut down some small segments that were just little uh, pieces of, of gold nuggets for schools etc so that they could take that away and use that with their senior teams and, and so certainly we'll be doing the same but yeah I'm, I'm thinking this needs to be a, a, a regular thing uh, in our program. So um, I won't screen share again, but just say that uh, this session is part of our uh, Ōtetahi Learning Days uh, this, this week. 
all sorts of things um, happening. And uh, if you have a chance, go to learningcitychristchurch.nz and you'll see the program for the rest of the week. Um, but also the, the whole aim is to connect the learning ecosystem of not just schools and tertiary, but businesses and community and look at ways uh, of increasing equity, access and innovation. So I think we're all on that page together and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in, in other spaces. Thanks so much for coming. And um, I'm going to stop the recording and um, say uh, matewa and 